Happy Friday, everybody. So we are continuing Lassie's journey through Scotland, heading south, trying to get home, right? And we stopped mid-chapter last time. Um, there was a description of an experience that a lady had while she was walking, through, Lassie was walking through the town and she fed her and gave her some milk and stuff. Now, the next section is about another experience that somebody has had as Lassie is journeying through their um, villages, okay? So, here we are. In a town 50 miles to the south, a thin-faced woman wrote a letter to her husband, who was away on a business trip. The letter read, We had a frightful experience the other day. We had a mad dog in the village. Constable McGregor saw it first and suspected it, for it had saliva flecked on its mouth. He tried to catch it, but it eluded him. I saw it coming down the street. I had been visiting Mrs. Tamson, and a terrible creature it was with its mouth gaping open and galloping wildly. The constable and many of the town boys were after it. I ran into Jameson's drapery and didn't come out for nearly an hour. It gave my heart such a turn. I heard later that they cornered it down Fennel's alley, and they thought they had it, but at the last moment it jumped over the rear wall, which, as you know, is at least six feet high. So it must have been mad, for no sane animal would have thought of attempting such a thing. Since then, we've had a rabies scare, and a st all stray dogs are being rounded up and taken to the pound. I think they should shoot all stray dogs, for no one knows what damage they may cause. I tell you, I have been very nervous about the whole thing, so I hope you hurry back as soon as you possibly can end your trip. <clears throat> Stories of cowardice and fear, as well as of trust and love, lay in the long trail over which Lassie patiently fought her way toward home. By the great Scottish industrial city, the river is broad. Along its banks are high walls and fences, for space on the river frontage is valuable, almost the lifeblood of the community. There, by the river, the towering cranes pick up gigantic pieces of metal. They move them to the frameworks where skeletons of steel arise. There are men, there the men clamor all day, drilling and riveting, adding the harsh tattoo of the mighty thumping of steam hammers. And there the great ships that later race across the Atlantic are born. <clears throat> The shipyards in the city are sprawled over every inch of the wide river. To cross from side to side there are, oh, there are chugging ferries, and in the city, the aged bridges that have carried traffic north and south for centuries. Over one of those busy bridges, Lassie trotted. For days, she had roamed the northern bank, seeking some way to cross, but this at last was, his, was her solution. She must walk among men. As she went along, often persons on the crowded pavement turned their heads and spoke a word to her but she paid no attention and threaded her way along and was soon lost to view in the crowds. But there were two men who did not let her get out of their sight. They were on a truck crossing the bridge. One on the front seat merely nudged his companion who drove and pointed toward the dog that went so intently. The other hmm, did not answer, but he nodded as if in happy agreement and set his truck at a speed which allowed him to keep Lassie in sight. At the end of the bridge, Lassie stepped forward steadily. <clears throat> her trot quickened a trifle, for now she felt at peace with her desire to get south. The river was behind her. For a second, a flash of vigor flowed over her, and her tail lifted a little higher so that she looked almost happy. She went, almost, she went along the pavement to the south. She did not heed the truck pulling up beside her. Along the multiple dins and smells of the city, there was no chance for her keen ears or nose to give her warning. Only at the last second, her animal senses warned her and she gave a leap. Something was moving through the air. She drove with, drove with her legs, but it was no use. About her was a net that strangled her efforts. For a full minute she fought, slashing at the imprisoning web, but she was only held the tighter, and now, kneeling beside her, was one of the men from the truck. He was holding her with expert hands. A thong was being twisted cruelly about her muzzle clamping her jaws shut. Another thong went about her neck. Still another was binding her legs together. Lassie lay still. Now she was ringed in by people. She felt the net being lifted, and with a mighty wrench she tried to tear away. Her forefeet came free. One hind leg was free. She was getting away. Lunging and wrenching, she fought against the man who held her. Now the other had thrown his body on her. If only she had the thong about her jaws free. She felt the strain as one man grabbed her at her foreleg, and then she was being beaten over the head. She lay half stunned. And then the man, the men halted their beating, for a voice came very clear from the crowd. 
It was a woman's voice, one with clipped accents. Here, you don't have to treat that dog as savagely as that. One of the men looked up from his kneeling. Who's it doing this job, he asked. Someone in the crowd started to snicker, but the laugh died as the young woman stepped forward. Her voice was stern. And if you think being impertinent is going to help you, you're mistaken. I've watched this entire proceeding and I intend to report you for both impertinence and cruelty. When the men spoke again, his tone had changed. I'm very sorry, Mum, but it's my duty, it is, and you can't be too careful. There's a lot of mad dogs around, and the dog catcher's got to do his duty. It's public protection. Nonsense. This dog has no signs of rabies. You can't tell, Mum. Anyhow, it's a stray, and we've got to pick up all strays. It's got no license tag. The young woman made as if to speak, but the man beside her touched her arm. Chap's right, Ethelda. Can't have hordes of homeless dogs running about. Got to have some sort of control, you know. That's right, sir, the dog catcher said. The girl looked about her, then her jaw set. Well, they don't have to control it that way. Get up, I'll put it in the van for you. It'll go, it'll get away from you, mum. Nonsense, stand up. We'll only have to go through it all again over, mum. Stand up. The kneeling man looked at the crowd as if to say what a hopeless thing it was to argue with a woman who had a silly idea. Then, as they rose, the girl kneeled. For a second, Lassie felt calm hands touching her, stroking her gently and soothing her with a soft voice. All right, give me a leash and take that net away. The men obeyed. The girl put the thongs gently round Lassie's neck. With one hand patting and calming, she pulled gently at the lead with the other. Come, stand up, she said. Lassie did what her years of training had taught her. She obeyed. She followed the gentle touch of the lead. She walked to the van and as the man opened the door, the girl lifted the thin collie in, and the grilled door clanged. There, she said severely, you don't have to treat even stray dogs like wild beasts. She turned and strode away, paying scarcely any attention to the man beside her. A fearful scene to make in public, Ethelda, he said at last. She did not answer, and they walked on across the bridge. Midway over, he looked at her and then stopped. Forgive me, he said. I should be kicked. You were very fine. They stopped and gazed in silence down the busy river. I wonder why it is, he said at length, a man always has a horror of making a show in public. Often he wants to do, well, something exactly like what you did, and he doesn't. Sort of cowardice, I suppose it is. Women are braver, you were very fine, and that's what I should have said in the first place. The young woman placed her hand on his coat sleeve in a gesture of understanding. It isn't me, it's the dog, she said. You know, she reminded me so much of Bonnie, you remember Bonnie, the collie we had when I was small? Oh, so I do. I'd forgotten. Well, but she was meant she was a magnificent creature, Ethelda. So was this one somehow, Michael. Oh, she was starved and bony, but somehow she reminded me of Bonnie. The same sort of patience and and as if she understood so much that it was a crime she couldn't speak to tell about it. She the man nodded and drew out his pipe. They leaned their arms on the parapet. What will they do with her? The young woman asked at last. Who, the blighters with the van? Yes. Oh, take her to the pound. I know, but what do they do there with stray dogs? I don't know. Seems to me they keep them or something. Specified length of time. Then if no one shows up, they do away with them. They'll kill her? Oh, it's quite humane. Gas chamber or something like that. Absolutely painless, they say. Just like going to sleep law or something about it and no one can save her i mean if her owner doesn't hear about it i think not is there a law or something if you go to the pound can you claim a dog that is if you pay the costs and whatnot the man puffed his pipe seems to me there is or there should be he looked up at the girl beside him and then he smiled come on he said mm -hmm. so lassie ends up at the pound with other stray dogs. Huh. This chapter is called Donal Never Trust a Dog. The van with its grilled door drew into a courtyard. The iron gates set in the great wall clanged behind it. <coughs> the van backed up so that it was as tight against so that it was tight against a raised entrance. Inside, Lassie lay quietly in a corner. There were other dogs in the van. During the ride through the city, they had lifted their voices in clamor, but Lassie had lain still, like a captive queen among her lesser prisoners. She had laid there, only her eyes alert, shutting out the exterior world, just as she had done when she lay ill beneath the gorse 
plump. She did not drop this air of dignity even when the grilled backdrop of the van was opened. The other dogs of mixed, br mixed breeds yelped anew and darted about. The two men seized them and urged them along toward a large concrete chamber. But Lassie did not move. She was the only one left in the van. Perhaps it was her calm and regal air that misled the man. Or perhaps, too, he remembered the facility with which the young woman had placed the dog in the truck. He entered the van with a small leash. Lassie lay quietly as if she'd been too proud to struggle and yelp for freedom as the other dogs had. Now she calmly suffered the hands to slip the thong over her head. As the lead was about to tighten, she, obe she rose obediently and she, as she had been taught to do from youth, began to follow the man. Down they came over the tailboard of the van and into the echoing corridor, Lassie going without either pulling ahead on the leash nor dragging behind on it. This too may have lulled the man, for just as they reached the place where his assistant was holding open the barred door, he leaned down to unslip the leash. In that flash, Lassie was free. She leaped away from the passing of the beam of light, oh, like the passing of a beam of light. The man jumped to bar her path, but his human coordination was snail-like compared to that of the animal. Lassie turned herself in flight, even as he started to move, and drove herself between his legs and the wall. Down the corridor she went, and then she pulled to a halt. Her way was blocked. There was nothing before her but the looming interior of the van, which she had just left, backed so truly against the entrance that there was not an inch of space on any side. She turned and dashed back, straight to the, into the faces of the men who charged after her. Dodging their arms and legs, she catapulted past them again. At the left was a stairway. She raced for it. At the top, a corridor stretched crosswise. One direction went south. She raced down it. Now, behind her, the building began to echo with cries. There were people in the corridor. Hands grabbed at her as she raced along. Twisting like a football back, she went to the length of the court. She went the length of the corridor, and then she halted. The corridor ended at a blank wall. There was a window, but it was closed. Lassie wheeled. Now, back down the hall, the long hall, men were gathered. They were advancing. Lassie looked about her. There were many doors at each side of the way, but they were all closed. There was no escape. Her captors seemed to be confident of that, for now the two men with peaked caps appeared, and the voice of the dog catcher rose. Stay where you are, everyone, please. We've got her now. Just stay where you are so she can't get back down the corridor. She won't bite anybody. She's not a bad dog. Slowly the man advanced. Behind him was his assistant with the net. They came nearer and nearer. Proudly, Lassie stood at bay. With her head high, she waited. And then escape came. For right beside Lassie, one of the forbidding doors opened and a voice sounded. It was an important voice, an official voice. What's going on out here? Do you realize there's a court of law sitting? And that's as far as he got. For at that moment, a tawny figure streaked by him, almost upsetting him as it cannoned off his legs. His face was twisted his face twisted itself into an expression of horror and outraged dignity. He gave one glance of utter contempt to the two men with the net, and then he shut the door. Now inside the room, the air echoed with sound, for Lassie was racing about looking for some means of escape. But in that large room, there seemed to be none. All the doors were closed. At last, in a corner, Lassie stood at bay. People moved away from her, leaving her isolated. The banging and scraping of chairs and the cries slowly sank and the only noise left was that of a thumping gavel. Then a somber voice spoke. Do I understand that this is the surprise witness that the defense has promised? Immediately the room rocked with laughter. Young men in somber costumes smiled broadly. The imperious, imperious figure wearing the enormous white wig allowed himself to smile too, for he was far, for he was famed far and wide for his piercing wit. And moreover, this case had been long and tedious. So it was a courtroom, right? His remark would be repeated and reprinted in newspapers, the length and breadth of the land. Another report comes today and meant the spark sparkling humor of that renowned legal wit, Justice McQuarrie, sitting at the great man nodded affably so that his wig almost came onto his forehead. At that moment, Lassie barked once, shortly. The great man beamed. I presume that it is an answer in the affirmative. And I may add that this is the most intelligent witness I have had before me in 20 years, for it is the first one that can answer yes or no without equivocation. Again, the great room rocked with laughter. 
The young man in gown, men in gowns nodded like man, mandarins and turned to one another. Old Macquarie was in excellent form today. Now, as though deciding that he alone should decree how long laughter should last, the judge thumped with the gavel. His brow furrowed. His eyes were stern. Sergeant, he roared. Sergeant. A uniformed man hastened before the tribunal and stood at attention. Sergeant, what is that? It's a dog, your lordship. A dog? The judge turned his glance on the animal still at bay in the corner. You confirm my own suspicion, Sergeant. It is a dog. The judge said affably. Then his voice broke into a roar. Well, what do I want done with it? I think I know what is in your mind, your lordship. What is in my mind, sergeant? You wish it removed, your lordship. I do. Remove it. Remove it. The sergeant looked about him in hurt amazement. In all his years as an official, such a problem had never before arisen. Perhaps it had never arisen in all the history of law. Perhaps there was no official and recognized procedure set down by any book or statute for the proper engineering of such a matter. Every other possible thing had been thought of, but dogs? Not that the sergeant could remember. Dogs from court, removal of. Perhaps it was listed somewhere, but the sergeant couldn't remember it. And if there were no official course of action to be followed, how should one? The sergeant's face suddenly brightened. He had solved it, the stairway of authority. He turned toward the man who had opened the door and allowed Lassie to enter. McLosh, remove this dog. Where did it come from? The red-faced guardian of the door looked reproachfully at his superior. Nah, dude, she's wiggled away for Ferguson and Donnell. They, they, they twas out there, n they twas out there, the new wit lashings of ropes. The sergeant turned and translated in more official language to the judge. The dogs escaped from the pound authorities, your lordship. Two of them are outside now. And since the apprehension and detention of stray dogs properly comes with the duties of the pound. I won't make an official ruling on that, but unofficially, Sergeant, unofficially, again the delighted young men in robes smiled at each other. Unofficially, I should say it is in their province. Admit them and order them to remove this animal. Very good, your lordship. Escaping hurriedly, the sergeant went to the door. Get it out here quick before he loses his temper, he whispered, whispered huskily. During the net, the two men entered the court. The legal array stood in eager interest. It was certainly a relief from the droning on of this dull day. The two men crept toward the corner slowly and warily. We'll soon have her out here, your lordship, one said in a con conciliating tone. But as he spoke, Lassie wheeled away. She knew that net. It was a hateful enemy. She must escape it. Again, the room became bedlam. The younger men took every advantage of the situation, and like schoolboys, they lifted their voices in hunting cries. Yikes! Gone away! Look, hello, Watson, there by the desk. Tally-ho! Hey, ow, my shin! Cheerily, they whooped, and in high glee did their best in every way to impede the men with the net, managing to upset them at every opportunity as they pretended to help corner the dog. But at last the fun had run its course. Lassie was penned by the wall. The ring of men crept nearer, and above her was an open window. She leapt to the ledge and then stood there in hesitation, for below her was the courtyard where the van still stood. There was a sheer drop of twenty feet to the concrete below. The men came forward confidently. They knew that it was too far to leap. They spread out the net. Out on the ledge, Lassie trembled. Off to the left was the roof of the van. It was only ten feet below, but it was far too, or too far away. She crouched, her paws dancing as if to get better footing, her muscles trembled, for a dog is not like a cat. Like men, a dog has learned to fear heights, and yet it was the only way. Crouching, gathering her muscles, Lassie stood. Then she leaped. Out she drove as far as she could toward the top of the van. Even as she went through the air, she knew she was falling short. Her sense of time and balance told her that she could not land safely. Reaching out with her forelegs, she just touched. For a brief second, she hung there as her hind leg scrambled on the side. Then she dropped to the ground heavily, and she lay stunned. <clears throat> Above in the courtroom, the windows were lined with faces. The dog catcher gave a sharp cry. Now we've got her. He turned with his companion, but they were stopped by a sharp command. The judge frowned at them, and when he spoke, it was as if all humor had gone from the day. This is a court of law. You will go quietly, gentlemen, please. I will declare a recess. The gavel thumped, and all stood as the old, age-old cry of, 
Oh, yes, sounded. Grumbling, the two men made their way from the room. One, once in the corridor, they raced along. That plume and dog, the older panted. I'll show her. Wait till I get. But when they got to the courtyard, they looked about in amazement. There was the van. There was the spot where Lassie had lain, stunned. But she was not there. The yard was empty. Well, if it isn't the end of a bloomin' perfect day, Donald, the older puffed. She should be dead down here. Where is she? Gone over the wall, Mr. Fergus Ferguson. Six foot. She should be dead. But that ain't no blasted dog, Donald. That's a bloomin' vampire. They went back into their quarters in the basement. Mr. Ferguson, isn't a vampire a thing with wings? Exactly, Donald. That's what I mean. An animal would need wings to get over that wall. Donald stretched his head. Once, he said, I saw one of the cinema pictures about a vampire. The older, stern, the older spoke sternly. Now, Donald, here I am trying to set my mind on this matter, an important matter, that is, and you're raving about cinema. You never make headway in the, ser in the service of the municipality if you go on like that. Now, the thing is, what shall we do about this dog? <laughs> there he is, scratching his head, trying to figure out what to do. Donald pulled his lip. I had a kin. Uh, well, think. What would you do if you were alone? Donald went into a deep study. At last, his face broke like a sunbeam. We take the van and go out in a boat and look for her again. The other shook his head and as if he despaired of mankind. Donald, aren't you ever going to learn? Learn? What ain't I learning the new? Knocking off time. Knocking off time, Ferguson said with emphasis. How many times have I told you? When you're a civil servant, you keep your working hours. If you start to toil all day, all hours of the day and night, first thing you'll know, they'll be expecting it all the time. That's right, I forgot. Forgot. You forgot. Well, don't forget. Set your example by me, lad. Then you'll get somewhere. The, uh, the young one looked shamefaced. No, said the other. Make your head, save your feet. That's what what we do, the new, is make out a report. <laughs> make out a report. He got a pencil and paper. For a long time, he sucked the end of the pencil. This is hard to do, Donald, he said at length. It's a sort of black mark on the escutcheon, escutcheon of the department. For 22 years I've been here, never before, in all my service, has a dog got away. And I hardly know how to report this. Donald scratched his head. Then inspiration came. Well, look, couldn't you just forget it? Don't say not about it. The other looked up in admiration. You might have something there, Donald. You learn it at last. But one very important thing you forgot. There's yon happenings in the court. They'll be noised about with <laughs> we <we'll> do. <laughs> I have no idea what that's trying to say. They'll be noised about with oot do. Aye, said Donald excitedly, but you can say we cooped, we copped the beggar at that. If they wish to test it, we can say it's yon big rough beggar in there that we caught this morning. Just report in one less, and then you'll not have an escaped dog to put in that blot on your uh, escutcheon. Donald, ye have it. So what are they going to do? <laughs> They're just going to forget about Lassie and say that it was a different dog that they had caught earlier in the day that got into the courthouse. Vigorously, the older set to work. For half an hour, he wrote painfully. He had just finished when the buzzer rang. The door opened and a policeman entered. Behind him followed the young woman and man who had stood by the bridge. This is the pound, sir, the policeman said. The man advanced. I am informed, he said, that on payment of pounds, costs, and license fee, I can secure any unclaimed dog here? That's right, sir. Well, then, I, er, this young lady, that is, wishes to secure that collie captured this morning. Collie? Ferguson echoed, thinking fast. Collie? No, there was no collie captured this morning, sir. The young woman stepped forward. Look here, what are you trying to do now? You know very well I was present when you captured a collie this morning and handled it roughly. You did, too. If you're up to any tricks about it, Captain McKeith here will have it looked into. Ferguson scratched his head. Well, I'll tell you the truth. It escaped. It what? The girl asked. It escaped, Mum. Anyone here can tell you about it. It broke loose and got up in Justin McQuarrie's Justice McQuarrie's court, and jumped from the window and got over the wall, and it's gone. Gone? For a moment, the girl stared. Then a look of happiness crept over her face. I don't know whether you're telling the truth or not, the young man said, but to make sure, I'm going to put it in a, in a written request for that dog. He made a note in a small pocketbook and turned away. 
The girl went with him gladly. I'm sorry, Ethelda, he said as they went up the stairs. The young woman smiled. It's all right. I'm glad, don't you see? It's free again. Free. Even if I don't have it, it's free. Downstairs in a subterranean office, Ferguson blustered before his assistant. Now I'll have to report it escaped, for the blighters undoubtedly will make a request for it, and I'll have to explain why I cannot give him the dog. Savagely, he tore up his painfully written false report. All that fine work for naught. Now, let that go for to teach you a lesson, MacDonald. Or Donald, what conclusion would you draw from all this? Never make a false report. Make a false report, Donald replied dutifully. Ah, no, Ferguson said in scorn. You'll never progress in the service, Donald. The conclusion is draw to draw is this. Never trust a dog. You take that one. There she pretended to be as meek as babe in arms, as you might say. As a babe in arms. I trust her for just one second. And she turns like a ball of fire on Judgment Day. There she ought to be afraid to jump. And what else does she do? She jumps, Donald replied. That's right. She ought to be dead. And what is she? She's alive. Right again. Then she ought not to have been able to jump on yon wall. And what does she do? She jumps over it. Right once more. And so the moral is, Donald, as long as you're in this job, never trust a bloomin' dog. They ain't, well, they ain't human dogs, ain't. They just ain't human. <laughs> Isn't that true? They aren't human. That is the end for today. Hope you guys enjoyed that part of the story. That was kind of fun. Uh, we'll see you again on Monday. Have a great weekend. Bye.